Hi everyone. This week in EDF 5135, we are looking at teaching with Shakespeare. And as the lecture goes on, you might have some ideas about why I've put that with in brackets, and we can talk about that in the workshop. My aim in this uh, online lecture is threefold. Firstly, I want to help frame the study of Shakespeare with reference to some of the theories of dialogic teaching and learning that we've been looking at earlier in English A. This way of teaching with Shakespeare engages with this idea of the open-endedness of language and texts and the idea that texts are interconnected with, with each other and that the meanings we make in the classroom are with that history of the text but also with each other in the dialogue we have in the classroom. In this way, I think teaching with Shakespeare probably, in many respects, will resemble teaching any other literary text. There's some familiar principles that you would be able to apply from this week to any text that you end up teaching. Secondly, I want to share with you some teaching ideas, some strategies I've used in the classroom and an approach to planning for teaching a text such as a Shakespearean text that you might be able to adapt to your circumstances. The idea, though, is not that I'm offering some kind of definitive answer to teaching Shakespeare. You will adapt ideas you pick up from this course and other teachers for your own students and circumstances. And you'll also be developing your own stance with respect to how you want to approach teaching literature. Ultimately, my aim is uh, hopefully to excite you about the prospect of teaching Shakespearean texts and to help you feel licensed to take a creative and diverse approach to teaching Shakespeare and any other literary text. So a, a key idea in this lecture is from Rob Pope's book, English Studies Reader. Rob Pope talks about serious play. And I think that this is a really interesting idea that we can take into our teaching and learning around a lot of texts that people have can get quite uptight about. This idea of serious play combines engagement with sort of the more complex and challenging aspects of teaching literature with this idea that they are open texts and open to new interpretations and new uses. So let's dive in. Today's talk is um, about some initial considerations of planning your Shakespeare unit and why you might have Shakespeare in your course. We're going to look at Shakespeare as a dialogic writer and think about how he's historically he was from a time when people wrote and produced plays in collaboration with others and what the pedagogical implications of that are. We're going to touch again on these principles of dialogic teaching and learning and take that into a consideration of what is called the teaching learning cycle. Some of you will have come across the idea of the teaching learning cycle elsewhere in your course and others will find that it's a new idea. But I'm introducing it today as a good way of thinking about planning a unit in a literary study in English classrooms. And I'll also be introducing alongside that some ideas for teaching Shakespeare that you can adapt, use or ignore if that's what you wish um, for your own placement experiences and beyond. So when I ask colleagues about why Shakespeare winds up on so many uh, curriculum and syllabi. I, and when I think about my own rationale for including Shakespeare in what I teach, we get a range of responses. These are some of the responses that uh, I've come across from, from colleagues that are thoughtful and that I, I, I esteem for their opinion and also that are out there in the, in the published research on teaching Shakespeare. The first one's really interesting. So if you're going to have Shakespeare on your on your syllabus or in your course, really the question is why. Uh, there has to be a really good reason for including the texts that you teach in your curriculum and there has to be some kind of benefit or value for you, the faculty, and also, of course, the students. So what kinds of thinking do you want your students to engage in as they study a Shakespeare text? Does the Shakespeare text offer some unique and special opportunities to extend thinking? Could you use essential questions, such as what we saw in Wilhelm, the reading from Wilhelm, to guide inquiry into the big issues relevant to young people's lives? Where are your students at? What are their interests? Where's their development? 
what kind of relationships are going on in the class, what are their preferred ways of learning. How can you, when you're planning this unit, provide opportunities for students to co-construct their own understandings of the text? <clears throat> now this is linked to what Nat Bellis was talking about in relation to the Ian Reid idea of the literature gallery and the literature workshop. We really, um, in, in English, the English team, we're really quite keen to convey to you the idea that it's much more productive for students to feel like they can come up with a reading of the text rather than having sort of this static reading from above imposed on them as the only possible reading that anyone could get out of that text. Are you offering opportunities for serious play with the text? Are there opportunities for multimodal meaning making, including popular culture literacies? How are you going to get the students reading the Shakespeare text? Is it necessary for them to read the whole text from the first line to the last? Or are there other ways that you can plan for them to actually grapple with the language? Are there specific literate practices you want your students to develop that the Shakespeare text offers an opportunity for them to develop? And do you have a cogent rationale in your team, the teaching team, for what you're going to do with this unit that's reflected in the stages of learning and the assessment outcomes that you're planning for. So these are not, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the things you would be considering with your team when you're approaching teaching a Shakespeare text. Now, one of the things that we're really thinking about in relation to Shakespeare this week is this idea of versions. What we have here on, on the slide are images from different productions of the same play, Hamlet. Shakespeare is himself represented in different ways to serve different people's ideas about who he is or what literature should be, what the study of English should be. And similarly, when you see different productions of Shakespeare's works, you realise that there's lots of different takes that people have on even what seems to be the same play reflective of different contexts and different interpretations of the play. When you are thinking about planning a unit and, and you're working with your students, one of the ways to think about what you're involved in is that it's similar to what uh, an, an actor troupe or a theatre company or a film production unit is involved in in approaching a Shakespeare play. Everyone has to sort of come to a sort of agreement, a group agreement about how they're going to interpret the play. So this idea of interpretation is really important. There's two meanings of interpretation that are fundamental to what we're thinking about here. One is this idea of making meaning, coming up with a reading by working with the text, working with others, talking, acting, watching, considering the other idea of interpretation, which is really evident when you think about Shakespeare, is this use of the word to mean a classic text that's been around for a while and someone's particular performance of it. Now, that can be in music as well as in, in drama. And when people say an interpretation, they mean someone's way of performing it that shows a different side to the, to the text or the original that gives us a different view of it. This is really potentially powerful for us as, as English teachers, this idea of interpretation, because no one owns Shakespeare. It, he belongs to everyone. He's open for everyone to have a take on, to form an interpretation and to get a view on. And you and your students, in the end, hopefully, come up with your interpretations of Shakespeare's plays. So... Leading on from there, some key words in the approach to Shakespeare I'm talking about today. It's interpretations, transformations, and I've got here in italics with a question mark, mutations. So this idea of interpretation, the performance, that foregrounds different meanings evident in the text and constructed by the people working with the text. You can see that in any performance of Shakespeare play. Transformations is a really interesting idea that's come to the fore in postmodern times, this idea that we take an original text and actually change it in some way to speak to contemporary tastes, contemporary media and contemporary concerns. So you can see here in an, an image from a BBC series called Shakespeare Retold. And 
in that series, the performances were sort of recontextualised into modern times. And Macbeth, for example, was recontextualised in a London kitchen in the competitive world of high-end cookery and chefs and restaurants. And we've got James McAvoy as Macbeth and Keely Hawes as Lady Macbeth in this recontextualised performance of Macbeth. And it's a good one to look at if, you, if you're able to find it. Mutations is an interesting idea too, this, this, this concept that in postmodern times we remix and take and borrow bits and pieces from classic and earlier texts and put them into new forms that mash them up with other texts so that they speak to each other in a conversation. And that's this idea of mutations, of, of culture being about transforming and making new some things from old, older times. And all three of these ideas, these keywords, you can bring into your practice teaching Shakespeare's texts. Which brings us back to this fellow Bakhtin. Remember we, we met Bakhtin a few weeks ago uh, in an image of him looking a little like a chef himself. And there's this key quote from the Dialogic Imagination that speaks to this idea that texts are unstable, that they're, they're not static, they don't have set meanings, they're actually always in play. He says the word in language is always half someone else's. It becomes one's own only when the speaker populates it with his own intention, his own accent, when he appropriates the word, adapting it to his own semantic and expressive intention. Prior to this moment of appropriation, the word does not exist in a neutral and impersonal language. It is not, after all, out of a dictionary that the speaker gets their words, but rather it exists in other people's mouths, in other people's concrete contexts, serving other people's intentions. It is from there that one must take the word and make it one's own. This idea of appropriation and dialogue is really powerful when we think about what the fate of Shakespeare's texts is. We, we see them performed over and over, and each theatre troupe, each class, each student, each teacher has to some way work with Shakespeare's texts in a way that it, his, his words become our own in some way, that there's this powerful work that we have to do to work with Shakespeare's language and understand the ideas, but also kind of make them our own ideas in a way and assimilate them to our own circumstances in creative and often surprising ways. So moving on from Bakhtin, we can also see that Shakespeare himself was a dialogic writer. Now, this idea of the, the artist or writer or writer like Shakespeare as this lone genius working away in a garret struck by inspiration is actually an idea that post-dates Shakespeare. In the 16th and early 17th century, that was not the notion that people had about writing so much as a more collaborative idea, an idea about borrowing from texts and remixing and mashing up that's more familiar to us from our time. Shakespeare was pretty happy to borrow and remake from earlier texts to his heart's content. So for some examples we've got of this is Hamlet, one of Shakespeare's tragedies, actually has a number of different sources that we can see here on the screen. Most potently, there's a very strong resemblance between Hamlet and another text that was published just prior called The Spanish Tragedy by another playwright from the Elizabethan era called Thomas Kidd. And there's some evidence in the historians and, and scholarly work that Kidd and Shakespeare actually collaborated on writing some plays, and that was a common practice at the time. So in a comment from Garden in his 2014 text called Shakespeare Reloaded, he says Shakespeare's only contribution to the actual story of Hamlet were probably the decision to use the name Hamlet for both the play's hero and his murdered father, the ghost, and the creation of the Fortinbras character. The Spanish tragedy includes a ghost, a character called Horatio, and a play within a play. I think this is a really interesting idea that Shakespeare himself was a dialogic writer. He's working in a theatre scene in London at the time where people were collaborating, more or less just 
openly pinching from each other's work, going through historical texts, raiding old historical accounts and older plays for ideas and kind of remaking them for the audience's tastes and the concerns of their time. And this is quite a licensing and enabling idea for us because it means that Shakespeare is not sort of in a glass case and a stable kind of text where there was this stable meaning even in the time in which it was written. So another example is Macbeth. So Shakespeare sourced the idea of Macbeth from historical texts, the Chronicles of England, Scotland and Ireland. The actual Macbeth, by all accounts, was a just and legitimate king. And the context of Shakespeare's writing Macbeth was the kingship of King James I, who believed in witches, was a Protestant king, oversaw the creation of the King James Bible, and Macbeth was performed the year following the gunpowder plot by Guy Fawkes. So Shakespeare's play portrays the cosmic punishment meted out for regicides and those disloyal to the monarchy. So a lot of Macbeth's context of the time was directly attributable to the political atmosphere of London at that time. Also, Shakespeare was really keen to show that he was loyal to the Protestant monarchy because he came from a Catholic family. So there was potential awkwardness and perhaps even something quite a bit worse than awkwardness there. And lastly, Romeo and Juliet is another example. Uh, again, we've got another play, The Tragical History of Romeo and Juliet, and the historical fact of two 13th century families were in a feud, the Capaletti and the Montecchi. Again, Shakespeare is clearly quite happy to raid any source that looks promising for making his own plays. There's, there's not this idea of the lone genius being struck by divine inspiration. We've got something quite different here as a model for creativity that licenses us to use that same kind of serious, playful attitude towards his texts. So what does this mean? What are the implications for the way we teach Shakespeare so far, what are the implications for pedagogy? And I've got here a bit of a take on an Andy Warhol kind of image with Shakespeare and shades. How do we make him new? How do we recontextualize Shakespeare as the dialogic writer in our times of multimodal collaborative meaning making? So for mine, I've, I have a few ideas about a rationale for teaching Shakespeare in a secondary English classroom. Some of them are cultural heritage kind of ideas. We touched on Terry Locke's idea of cultural heritage last week. And some of them are other ideas. Shakespeare's really got this inexhaustibility about his text. You can teach them year in, year out. You always find something new. They're so rich. They're so rewarding of close study. And students, again and again, have a real sense of that sense of discovery of having accomplished something from grappling with a challenging text that's very rich in meaning. The cultural heritage idea is this idea that's in our DNA, that Shakespeare's works are part of the Anglophone world and that a lot of his ideas have been sort of passed down as, as an inheritance to us and that it sort of behooves us to help our students access that rich cultural heritage. But again, lots of students come from non-Anglophone backgrounds, so there's going to be a challenge there in thinking about how can we set up a dialogue between different cultural heritages in our classroom. Historically, Shakespeare's interesting because he's at the beginning of modern ideas of the self. The plays portray this, there's this, this emerging idea that a person is not just their role, it, it's not ju just their externally derived identity from their place in the social pecking order, that in fact people can change their, their fate, they can change their life through introspection and free will. These were new ideas in Shakespeare's time and we can reflect on that as moderns and postmoderns ourselves and help our students think about the dilemmas that that modern idea of the self throws up. There's lots of perennial themes that we can connect to, power, love, loyalty, betrayal. These are themes that are still dealt with in popular TV series. As you can see, um, I've got a reference there to House of Cards. And 
Certainly, House of Cards deals with a lot of similar Shakespearean ideas and quotes Shakespeare extensively in the, in the TV screenplays. We've got a resource for prototypes of different kinds of plot characters and themes. But I've got two caveats there. I think that Shakespeare, I think ideally shouldn't be taught just because it's Shakespeare or just because it's a classic and we have to have it. It's not just the text that makes an English curriculum. It's the way that it's taught. And Shakespeare is perhaps best taught in a balanced diet where we've got a range of texts and a range of modes and a range of opportunities for learning over the course of a year we have with a class. Speaking to the common objection to teaching Shakespeare, which is that uh, he represents a canonical view of English literature that is exclusive, that is thoroughly drenched in ideas of patriarchy and a uh, white worldview. They certainly can be. And again, this comes back to this idea of texts and the way they're taught. Taught, taught as monoliths, as untouchable monuments to a culture that can't be questioned, certainly those texts are problematic. Taught as part of a resource that's democratically available to everyone and part of a global economy of literature and ideas that anyone can access, that position in that way becomes a lot less problematic. For example, Toni Morrison, who's a Nobel Prize winning African-American novelist, spoke in her speech, Unspeakable Things Unspoken, about the value of canonical literature for her own practice as a black American writer. She said, and I at least do not intend to live without Aeschylus or William Shakespeare or James or Twain or Hawthorne or Melville and so on. There must be some way to enhance canon readings without enshrining them. I think this is a really powerful statement from an amazing writer who has worked tirelessly to expand our sense of the human and to challenge ideas about race in her country and beyond. As a writer, she doesn't see any reason to do without the immense cultural resource and the immense value and richness of texts that we've inherited from times past. Again, it's that way of teaching them. Do we teach them to enshrine them, to say this is an untouchable, holy, sacred thing, or are we teaching them as a resource for making meaning and getting stuck in and working with text to make our own meanings? And I think the distinction is a really powerful one. So to sort of come to some provisional conclusions at this point about Shakespeare, his place in, in the canon and in English curriculums more broadly, and how we might approach him as dialogic teachers and learners. One analogy is that he's kind of like an open source software, like your Linux. Uh, he can be used by anyone to make new meanings and to connect to new texts. His history, and as well as his use today, points up that literary production is a dialogic process. We make meaning with and through language with him and a whole host of other texts. Texts are intertextual. They connect and reference each other, and this is evident in the way that Shakespeare himself wrote his plays. There's context to be considered, the political and social context of Shakespeare's time, and what are the similarities to the political and social context of our own times, and certainly there are many. In fact, uh, I saw one class where students connected the plot of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth to the period in the Labor Party where Julia Gillard unseated Kevin Rudd from his prime ministership. And they were discussing how in modern times, a powerful woman doesn't need a proxy for her power in the way that Lady Macbeth does, but can take power herself. This was a very interesting discussion that I observed between Year 10 students in an outer suburban school and they were able to make that connection between the text they were studying and some con contemporary and current political events that they were observing. And students will make these connections and work with them if we provide opportunities for them to do so. So importantly, we're making connections between the Shakespeare text out to other texts, popular cultures, current texts and issues, and we link in from other texts and contexts to the Shakespeare text. And that, that movement in and out, making links, 
from the text back out to the other texts and back again is a really powerful way of thinking about how you're going to incorporate other mo modes of meaning making with the traditional modes associated with Shakespeare's plays. So what does this all look like when you apply dialogic principles to teaching and learning in your Shakespeare classroom? I'm going to briefly touch on this idea of the teaching and learning cycle. The teaching and learning cycle is a really good way of thinking about planning a whole unit. You can adapt it and change it and adjust it as you go. But it's a good way of thinking about the sorts of steps and stages you might want to go through as you plan and enact a unit around a text. So initially you've got this idea of engagement. How are you going to interest students in the unit, connect to their prior understandings, prompt them to start thinking about the big issues? How are you going to build knowledge of the play? How are you going to get them reading the text, engaging with the characters and ideas? Then we've got a series of key scenes and versions and adaptations and scene performances, which I call serious play, where you could think about as messing about with the text in various modes. It links to the idea from Ian Reid of the literary workshop that we look at again uh, in next semester that Nat Ballas mentioned in week six. You also have to think about how you're going to get students to perform some close reading of the play or the poems. Along the way, you're collecting evidence of their learning, formative assessment, and using that information to plan as you go and adjust your lessons. Then students as a whole group, in small groups and as individuals, are developing an interpretation of the play. How are they going to get to a point where they sort of have a take on the play and what its concerns are overall, and how the play explores those concerns? There's a synthesis of the ideas that happens towards the end of the unit, but also being open to what a senior colleague of mine called the imponderables, those things in texts that aren't amenable to a closed reading or a solution that remain as sort of mysterious and open. So, for example, in Macbeth, Macbeth knows that killing King Duncan is going to is, is going to cause havoc, is a bad idea. There's whole soliloquies where Macbeth outlines all the reasons to himself about why he shouldn't do it and why it would unleash all kinds of regret and chaos. But he does it anyway. And in some ways, despite the influence we can see of Lady Macbeth, there's something a bit mysterious about why he still went ahead and, and did it, and even though he knew it was not going to work out. And that's one of the imponderables of one of Shakespeare's plays. Usually you're working towards some kind of summative assessment. It might be a text response essay. It might be a passage analysis. You might be teaching students in preparation for an external examination, and the form of that paper will be determining some of the things you're helping them prepare for. And at the end of the teaching learning cycle, there's reflection for the students about what the learning was like and where do we go from here, and for you as the teacher about how that unit went and what, what do I now plan in response to what I observed in my class during that unit. And you go back to the start again for engagement in the next unit. So thinking about this learning cycle, we're now going to move through some activities as examples of how you might engage, build knowledge, build up some serious play and messing about with the texts, developing some close readings and preparing students for assessment. So we've touched on essential questions earlier this unit where we looked at the Wilhelm reading. These are some essential questions I've used in a year 12 study of Macbeth. They're a bit more abstract than ones that Wilhelm used for his younger students, and there's more of them. And initially, I have used them to get discussion going with students. This is a way of engaging their prior learning or getting them to reflect on something that's happening in their life. And then you can come back to these questions periodically during your engagement with the text. And so in this case with Macbeth, I would come back to some of these questions as we engaged with various parts of Shakespeare's play. So ideas about ambition, at what point does ambition become ruthless and destructive? 
how much of our lives are de designed, decided by destiny or some kind of divine design, how much do we control the course of our lives, that we can, can we make changes in the direction our life takes, which is better to strive to improve one's lot in life or make peace with it. What makes a good leader is one of the key questions in a lot of Shakespeare's plays. Why are our strengths so often also our weaknesses? Very evident in the character of Macbeth. After someone has done great harm, can they ever be redeemed? What makes a good human life? Do we ever really know ourselves? This leads into some of those imponderables as well, the deep, rich, almost murkiness in Macbeth and some of other Shakespeare's plays. You then have the job of building knowledge and creating some initial engagements with the play. For most classes, you could safely assume that students are not going to have read the text prior to you doing a unit with them. Some students, some exceptional students, will read the text and do their best to make sense of it on their own. But you really are needing to think about how you can build that knowledge of the text in class and not be reliant on students having made sense of it in their private lives. One of the things that we can do is introduce movie posters and also talk about how they position the movie adaptations to a potential audience, what kinds of aspects of the text are being highlighted, and then show them movie trailers, various movie trailers of the text and have them make predictions about plot, character, setting, concerns, those sorts of ideas. Con contrasting different eras of film can be quite powerful and certainly the uh, Fassbender representation of Macbeth really builds on his appearance in um, online games and battle games and so he, he also is keying into his familiarity in popular culture as a certain kind of actor, a certain kind of portrayal that students can then really engage with. So then that brings forth the idea that Macbeth is quite bloodthirsty and ambitious, whereas earlier versions might portray different aspects of his character. Building knowledge also means engaging with a range of texts to support students' understanding of some of the basics of the text. We need to be mindful of cognitive load, asking students to make sense of plot, language, character, setting, theme all at once for many students is going to be too much. So we need to help them by providing some resources that gives them a framework to work with going forward. Don't be afraid of offering things like a written synopsis, using animated summaries that are available online, using or excerpting from illustrated and comic book versions, showing a film adaptation before engaging with the text. All of those activities are really good for building initial knowledge so students have a sense that they kind of can navigate their way around the story and the characters before being asked to engage with the complexities of Shakespeare's language. Some activities you can use to build up their knowledge are things like one minute scene performances, so giving students a scene and give, having them perform a sort of one minute pricey summary of the scene. Creating social network diagrams or maps of the characters and where they live. Creating trading card character summaries, which draws on students' knowledge of trading card games, or having a visual representation of the protagonist's journey, such as a board game. You then need to be moving in closer into the text. So this is build, continuing to build knowledge, but deepening it. So you need to be thinking about initial engagement with the language. One way to help getting, get students thinking about Shakespeare's language as not quite so alien and unapproachable is to have them think about the specialised languages that they're using in their own life. For example, text languages, the conventions of movie previews, the conventions of news bulletins, Facebook feeds, microblogging and emails, and using their knowledge of contemporary specialised languages to tap into the specialised language of Shakespeare's plays. So some examples are the captain's speech to King Duncan sent as a series of text messages from the battlefront, Macbeth writing an email to Lady Macbeth about victories in battle and the witch's prophecies, 
Macbeth and Banquo are exchanging messages on social media about the witch's prophecies. So these, these ideas should be fairly familiar to you by now after last week's work with pop culture literacies being used to study literature. So you're asking students to translate Shakespeare's language into today's idioms and you can ask them to incorporate key quotes and imagery directly from the play. And this uses these ideas of mashup and collaborative writing and juxtaposing new and old into new forms as part of the dialogic classroom and also builds on students' understanding of specialised literacies in their life outside school. And that's empowering for them as they approach what can be quite an intimidating text for many students. Performing key scenes really is vital when it comes to studying plays, Shakespeare's plays included. And in your workshops, we'll be sharing with you an example of a text made by myself and a, another colleague when we were asking our Year 12 students to for, perform a series of scenes and then use that performance as the basis of a close reading and analysis of that scene. So you can use performance as a way of students to embody their understanding of different characters and points in the plot. And it helps to link back to the essential questions. So you can have that recurrent engagement with some of the big ideas in the text. Performing scenes is also a good way of getting students talking, collaborating, thinking about props and costume and other aspects of performance that convey and suggest meaning to the audience. Other aspects of close reading work can be seen in the imagery. So for example, in Macbeth, Imagery to do with crowns and blood and seeds and children was something that I noticed in, in the text as sort of a recurrent idea or way of recalling ideas throughout the text of the play. Building on this, I asked my students to do an analysis of a chosen pattern of imagery and in pairs or trios, they worked with that in a variety of ways. One of those ways was they needed to find an image that matched the motif that they had chosen and they gave a short presentation and analysing that image and then they did some writing associated with that image. So they had the text from Shakespeare, some image, some visuals that they've collected that they think present that idea and then some analysis of how the key ideas are represented by that image. So you're also drawing on some multimodal thinking here and the power of the image to elicit imaginative thinking. So some examples of that, which I will be showing you, show some student work in response to this. So the students created a slide that matched quotes to images. They chose a motif from a list I provided them to work with. In class, they presented their slides and explained the connection between images chosen and the language of the play and the themes explored. And throughout this, we've got that movement back and forth over the different modes. They read, they talk, they find visual texts, they analyse, they present, and they move into writing. So here's an example from a student called Annabelle. So she looked at birds, particularly um, animals that portray or indicate an idea in the text. And so she looked at the raven in this slide and she found this picture of the raven and she spoke about how the raven had a particularly powerful meaning and she also spoke about the horses in the play. This is an image from a student called Vanessa. She looked at the image and motif of blood. She found this incredibly powerful image. She connected it to this text from Macbeth. And then she spoke about the different meanings of blood in the play she spoke about royal blood. She spoke about blood as inheritance and the idea of inheriting kingship and power, but also inheriting sin and the way in which Macbeth is cursed by his sin down the generations, as opposed to Banquo, who gets rewarded for his goodness down the generations. And so she was able to connect these ideas together by using an image as a way in. From there, I moved the students to a collaborative short writing task. So here we've got two girls who are working on the image of sleep. They've found quotes and scenes two and four <clears throat> about sleep from the text of Macbeth. And then in the right-hand box, they were able to make some notes 
about the meaning of sleep in that part of the play and the way in which it connects to other ideas in the play. So this is really looking at specific scenes, specific patterns in the text that enable students to collaborate. So each, each group of girls in this case had a different motif and together the class as a whole jigsaws an image of how these how these motifs are working in the play as a whole. And then a document's produced that's shared on Google Drive with all their writing. They share their writing with each other and this forms a basis for revision for the oral task, a close analysis of text that they were being asked to do at the end of the unit. So to sort of perform a mini conclusion at this point, we've got this idea of students building knowledge through a range of modes. You show films, you use image, you use visuals, you provide opportunities for collaborative and exploratory talk, you provide opportunities for performance and movement, you provide opportunities for collaborative writing and sharing ideas so that together, ideally, your class is building up a, a co-constructed understanding of the text together by engaging with it in a range of modes. In the workshops, we're going to be engaging with some versions of the soliloquy. There's real power in working with Shakespeare's text, looking at different versions of sections of the play or different versions and adaptations of the play. So if we look at one of the soliloquies here for Macbeth, one of the last ones that Macbeth makes, and we have here different versions, links to different versions, which we'll be working with in the workshops. It's very powerful for students to compare different actors' performances of the same bit of text and to talk about what's been foregrounded, what's been emphasised and why that might be so, so that they can see that different people have different takes on the text and there's something quite rich in the text that enables those different interpretations and it helps them form their own view of what's going on in the text. So we're coming back to this idea from Rob Pope of serious play. This is from a extra text that was recommended for English education students as a supplementary textbook. It's a fantastic resource. He says the challenge then is to develop practices of reading and writing that operate in a variety of dimensions and develop in a variety of directions, simultaneously or by turns, critical and creative, theoretical and practical, historical and contemporary, for only in this way can texts be fully grasped as ongoing processes as well as achieved products, and words be used for experiment and exploration as well as analysis and argument, in short, for serious play. And I think this idea of serious play can inform so much of what we do in secondary English classrooms that makes for engaging but also challenging and worthwhile activities for students to be involved in. Sometimes we have a class that's quite challenging and it's very difficult to come up with close reading and building knowledge tasks that they are prepared to have a go at. These two images are from a Year 8 class that was quite a challenging class. There was a lot of special needs in the class and there was, so I would say, a disengagement from learning going on for many of the students in that class. Reading the play was simply out of the question as the main activity that we were going to be doing in this class. But I wanted them to, to build some understandings of the play we were studying, which was A Midsummer Night's Dream. So after showing the film and talking about the different worlds of the text, the human world, the fairy world, and the world of the lovers, I ask them to think about how movie posters and play posters try and represent aspects of, of a play or film to entice viewers to come in. And so the task I asked them to, to do was to create a visual representation of the different worlds in A Midsummer Night's Dream. And there were sort of rules, if you like, they had to show the different worlds, have to suggest the different worlds in some way in their design, and they had to include a, an appropriate quote or quotes in their design. As you can see, these two examples 
show a really good understanding of the different worlds represented in the play, particularly the fairy world, but there's also the world of the court in the one on the left, and they also found an appropriate quote. The one on the left also indicates the world of the mechanicals in the fellow dressed as a wall. This was the only time that this class asked to do more work on a task. They asked for more time to finish their posters. You could have knocked me over with a feather when they asked for this. It was probably the most engaged they were all year. And you can see that there are ways of helping students show their understanding, even when they're presenting you as a, with, as a challenging class. So serious play, we've looked at word, word clouds. This is a word cloud of Macbeth. You can use word clouds for a range of activities. We've touched on these already, but certainly you can use these to analyze keywords, to create found word poems, ask students to create a poem from the, the words evident in a word cloud. And as also a visual way into a text at the start in your engagement phrase. More serious play can be done with memes. So these are two memes that are available on the internet. So you use worked examples and invite students to create their own memes using references to pop culture or other aspects of popular culture that they want to introduce you to. It doesn't have to be text. The one on the left is um, not about a text as such, just a cat. But it gives students the opportunity, like with the poster activity for A Midsummer Night's Dream, to show ways of understanding and engagement with the text other than perhaps what we might consider more straight academic approaches. So coming back to this idea of transformation and mutation, towards the end of a unit, it can be quite powerful to show students a really unusual adaptation or transformation of of the text you're studying. I've mentioned the BBC Shakespeare Retold. There's also the peculiar production by Alan Cumming where he presents Macbeth as actually a patient in uh, a rather brutal insane asylum. And I think the entire plot is sort of his, his delusions. And then there's Akira Kurosawa's Japanese samurai adaptation of Macbeth in Throne of Blood. And I've shown the closing scenes of that where the corrupt samurai is shot by many arrows to a group of students and with great effect that students really were quite surprised and astonished and responded to that different version quite powerfully. So showing multiple versions and unusual transformations can be a really good way of finishing a unit on Shakespeare, on Shakespeare text and enliven students' ways of thinking laterally about what the text might mean. As a final thought, you can ask students to do their own adaptation and transformation. You can ask them to do movie trailers of their idea of how they would change and retell a Shakespeare text you've been studying with them. Or you can ask them to imagine that they are going to pitch a movie idea to a potential producer and movie studio, and they have to come up with a new cast time or an era, a setting or a location, and a proposed soundtrack for key scenes. This again taps into students' knowledge of popular culture and popular media and asks them to think laterally and imaginatively about how they could recontextualise a Shakespeare tale into the medium of movies. I found that such tasks are done very well and students can do them to a range of abilities, and every student really has something to bring to a task like this. You also learn a great deal about their own popular culture interests, and they enjoy educating us English teachers about the kinds of actors and singers that they're into. So to conclude, we're back to Bakhtin again. The principles that I've been talking about in relation to these ideas for teaching Shakespeare, really connect to this idea of the dialogic. Bakhtin says, truth is not born, nor is it to be found inside the head of an individual. It is born between people collectively searching for truth in the process of dialogic interaction. And hopefully you'll have an opportunity to experience that while you're out on placement, this idea of understandings of text being built up 
in classrooms through talk, small group work, whole class discussion, writing, engagement with a range of media. And when it works, it's delightful. It doesn't always work. This is not a sure guarantee that every lesson will go beautifully. But certainly, it does get us away from this idea that we must inculate students in the canonical interpretation and it's their job to regurgitate it. Uh, it really it gives us much more license to be creative and to think of different ways of engaging our students in the study of classic works. Here are some of the works that I've been referencing during this talk. And hopefully you'll also find some of your own sources and understandings as you engage with the process of teaching Shakespeare in your classroom.